Wait, can I just ask who's going to Dabdam? Good. Just thought I might say some uh, encouraging words, friendly words about practice in Dabdam. It's actually been 10 years since I went to Dabdam, but I was thinking about it today and in the first 10 years of my training at Wat Nanachat and other monasteries, I did go to Dabdam on seven occasions. So I've had periods of practice there and found it very helpful. But I thought I might offer some friendly advice, at least about things, practices I did there or attitudes that were helpful. So first I remember, as a, I went as a novice, actually I've been a novice for four days, and I went to Daodam for the first time at the age of 23, I think. And I found it very difficult. Sukadama was saying to me at Wat Nanachat the other day, he's a bit concerned about being lonely. And I remember that there was definitely loneliness at times. And also I remember there was some challenges with, with depression because uh, modern people have had a lot of entertainment, a lot of distraction. And so when you find yourself in the jungle with not many meetings, and a lot of time by yourself, if you haven't trained your mind to be bright, sometimes it, it can be depressing to see how depressing your mind is. And your mind is depressing and then you get depressed about your depressing mind. And so the first time I remember there was a lot of just kind of getting through and I wondered actually how helpful it was at the time. But as a new novice, I hadn't established much discipline and I hadn't really learned how to use the forms that we're all training with. And so the next time I went to Daodam, I put some thought into how I might structure the time. So one thing which I think can be a bit of a mistake for some of us anyway, and I'll just warn you, is when we read the biographies of Lumpur Man and Dajan Lee and Lumpur Tate, which I think we all do, we read about how these incredible monks get their jhanas and start having their insights and experiencing and realizing paths and fruits seemingly quite quickly. And we, we hear about the fact that they do put forth a great deal of effort. It doesn't seem to be easy when they really practice a lot of sitting, a lot of walking, a lot of tudong, practicing with illness and sometimes with spirits and hostile entities, etc. It's very inspiring. And then, uh, but if we think, if you get this idea that you're going to get enlightened while you're at Daodam, um, I just want to give you a bit of a warning about this. Be careful. Because we all come into the training with a big sense of self. That's inevitable. And so when it's, when this kind of aspiration, I, I'm going to practice really, really hard and I'm going to try to get enlightened. And if that energy comes from a lot of willfulness, actually a sense of self which has an agenda, uh, you probably find that your mind will become, you probably can put forth quite a lot of effort and you probably can do some pretty impressive practice. But in terms of what happens to your mind, if you don't have, suppose you have an enormous amount of spiritual barami, and I hope you do, certainly you'll have some. Suppose you have an enormous amount of spiritual barami from your past practice in past lives, then people who take on that determination and practice a lot sometimes can get impressive results, wonderful results. But if most people are working with a more moderate amount of paramita, Paramis, then if we try to do our practice from a sense of self which has an agenda and also a time frame, what you find is the mind can become very brittle and uh, also very critical. So good to remember in the Dhamma Chakra Sutta, which we so often chant, Lord Buddha explains that the cause of suffering is three types of craving. And you've got the sensuality, 
which you'll all be experiencing in your mind in the jungle. When you go to the jungle you have a lot less sensuality, beautiful trees, beautiful stream, beautiful waterfalls, beautiful sky, nice animals and birds, but not much in terms of sensual pleasure. You'll probably get some quite strong desires coming up. And this is a good thing to notice, is it suffering? You can ask yourself, okay, is sensual craving suffering? When it comes up in the mind, and then we have to practice a lot of patient endurance and sometimes applying the antidote, thinking about the drawbacks of things like sexual passion. You don't just get the sex, of course, you, you get everything else that comes with that. You have to sometimes think about the drawbacks. But then there's a second type of craving, bhavatanha, this craving for becoming. And so when that comes up, I want to be a sotapanna, I want to be a sakadakami, I want to be an anakami, I want to be the Buddha, I want to be Lumpurman, whatever it is. If there's a lot of that energy, if it comes from a space of craving, what I found in my own practice is that when you act on craving, suffering isn't far behind. So what happens with these three types of craving, you can meditate, you can contemplate, reflect on this in your own practice and see if it rings true is that if you allow any one of these three types of craving to swell up in the mind, and if you act on it, then the others come as well. So there's a certain amount of craving in the mind, and so you might have a lot of fairly wholesome aspiration, but then, and you might do a lot of practice, but what can happen then is this really strong aversion, and irritation, anger, and even hatred can come up in the mind, and the mind can get very, very critical of your own practice, of other people's practice, of the senior monks, of the situation. And so you have to be very careful with how you relate to craving energies. And so what I wanted to recommend in terms of what I found to be a very helpful way to generate a healthy type of energy to then apply in the practice is faith. And you're looking at the list of the five spiritual powers, faith comes first. And so what I think is really useful is to think of the Buddha's enlightenment. And this chant that we do, sometimes we do it perfunctorily. I mean, really think about it, the Buddha, all those qualities, iti biso bhagava arahan samma sambuddha. What does it mean to be enlightened through his own efforts? Obviously, he spent millions of lives cultivating qualities and producing the merit to be able to do that. When you can think about that and just feel gratitude or even love, and if you can give rise to feelings of loving the Buddha, and you can give rise to feelings of a deep faith in his enlightenment, and then you put forth a lot of effort in your own practice as an expression of gratitude. So this is using faith, and gratitude is very close to mudita, brahmi vihara. So if you can nourish and inspire your heroic effort with these very, very wholesome energies, I think you'll find that your mind will become a more spacious, moist, pleasant mind to be with. But if the energy comes from willfulness, and uh, I'm going to get enlightened, I'm going to get my jhanas, I'm going to get my jnanas, if you don't pay attention to where your middle way is, that's a kind of another thing I wanted to talk about, because my sense is that the middle way is slightly different for every different person. So, and what my feeling for what the middle way is now, after 20 years of practice, is to be pushing firmly and gently and consistently. I really found for myself that that gets the best results. And if you push really, really hard, you force yourself to walk John Crum and sit meditation 10 or 12 or 14 hours a day, you can do it for a period of time, and at a certain point you might find you get incredibly frustrated and then you might sleep for a week, and like I was saying, you can get very inspired and get a lot of faith energy, but then you can suddenly become very critical of yourself and of others and the whole situation. But if you, if you try to experiment with what's the right amount of effort, where it's more than you would normally do, and you're definitely have to, having to go against your laziness, complacency, ambivalence, having to push a bit more. And so can you do that consistently? That's what I would suggest. So if you set a certain minimum that you don't go under rather than a maximum that you try to do a day and you can place that minimum fairly fairly high make it you know don't make it too easy 
but don't push too hard. They try to nourish your practice from faith. And uh, then I would also say, don't neglect to spread loving kindness to your brothers in the holy life. And so the Lord Buddha does say in the suttas, monks come back from your arms round to spread the metta in those, just that chant we did, this comes straight from the suttas, that after the arms round one should spread loving kindness to the village where one is dependent on arms. And then the northern direction, the eastern direction, the southern direction, the western direction, northeast, southeast, etc., above and below. So this is our instruction from the Lord Buddha to develop the Brahma Viharas because they keep the mind wholesome. And so if we can really see dukkha, as we all can, that's why we became monks, and if you have a lot of aversion to suffering and a lot of craving for enlightenment, this is actually not a good recipe or strategy for getting enlightened or for developing samatha or vipassana or if you see dukkha the dukkha is to be known and dukkha isn't to be resented dukkha isn't to be hated dukkha is to be known known with what known with a clear awareness that knows things as they are so dukkha isn't to be known by a sense of self which is fed up and pissed off and depressed and angry Dukkha is to be known with mindful awareness, which is clear and calm. Seeing Dukkha clearly, you get a sense for the causes of Dukkha. The causes of Dukkha are craving. So, aspiration is different to craving. You have Chanda, one of these four bases of success. Aspiration, we need to have aspiration. None of us will be keeping these precepts and committing to this training without our aspiration for enlightenment. Wonderful, beautiful. But then that desire, I'm going to get enlightened by the end of the week. That's not aspiration. That's willfulness coming from a sense of self. All of these wonderful monks who we revere and respect and love so much had a lot of practice behind them in previous lives. And so many of them, as we know, even as lay people, I know Tanatananan, Ajantan, actually had their jhana samadhi before they were bhikkhus. And so these kind of monks, they get quite extraordinary results once they become bhikkhus. But it's also obvious that they came into the world with quite extraordinary barami and merit. There's a chant that Thai people do at school, a kind of a folk song praising the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha. And Ajahn Anand from the age of seven, when he would sing this song, would, would weep tears of rapture and all of the hairs would go up on his arms and he would ask his friends, when we sing that song, does this happen to you? What's these tears? What's, why does my hair go up? He didn't even know what it was. But obviously he practiced Buddha Nusati in past lives and had a very strong quality of faith, even from childhood. So we have to understand that the kind of results that the Krubrajans got, they put a lot of effort into making the qualities in their minds right. They'd already practiced a lot and then they were picking up where they left off. We don't know how much merit we have, we don't know how much parami we have, we don't know how much effort we've already put into our practice. I really hope it's a lot. Certainly it is a lot actually, but sometimes there's a difference between a lot and then really, really a lot. For the fact that most people came from another country to ordain, there has to be incredible supports. And that's in talking about faith, that's a good thing to have faith in as well. You have to have faith in your potential. And you have to have faith in your good roots. The merit that got you to what Nana Chari in the first place. Actually extraordinary merit. So that's there, that's a given. And in terms of like, if the mind gets depressed for periods of time, really challenge that sometimes. Or if anyone has issues with self-hatred, I think it's good just to say to yourself, there is a certain amount of merit there. You've been ethical and generous and virtuous for many lives. That's a fact. If you believe in the law of karma. So sometimes if these are powerful self-aversion, that's the third type of craving, talking about those cravings, craving not for aversion, anger, irritation, hatred. So you'll see when you're in the jungle and you have a lot more time to yourself and a lot more time to meditate, you'll see the way these energies move around in the mind and find different objects, sometimes craving for, sometimes craving not for, craving for becoming. And then 
this is a danger if you really, really want to get enlightened and you don't, then all of a sudden you just want to obliterate yourself, annihilate yourself, and then you find yourself sleeping all day. So this is something to be careful of. But if you find the right amount of effort and you do it consistently, I think you'll find that your mind gets a little bit brighter, a little bit brighter, a little bit brighter. And it will have more of this appreciative consciousness. You'll appreciate the effort of your brothers and you'll appreciate Tao Dham. So just uh, having confidence, you already have a lot of good karma, you have a lot of merit, You've met a wonderful situation, I'm really happy for you actually. I think if you're going into the jungle for two months or longer, it's a really wonderful opportunity to put down duties and practice more sense restraint, put more effort into your meditation practice. And another thing I just wanted to say in terms of an attitude that really makes this life more enjoyable, more sustainable, and more nourishing, is to be interested in your mind. So when you're going into Daudam, it's this wonderful opportunity to learn all of the tricks that your mind has, all of the habits that it has. If we go in and we just think we're going to kind of destroy the unenlightened me and become an enlightened me, and you're just kind of plowing over all of your experience with willfulness, you might not learn very much. But if you pay very close attention, just be interested with mindfulness, with awareness, truth discerning awareness, which Manindo sometimes calls mindfulness, sitting back a little bit, relaxing and paying attention. And you start to learn about your kilesa. And you start to see your delusion and then you start to see through it. You see, this, this mindful awareness, when it sees through delusion, the delusion falls away by itself. You don't have to destroy it. Delusion is based on ignorance. So ignorance as to what? Ignorance as to the three characteristics. When you just pay attention and you see, oh, it really is impermanent. And whatever strong passions come up, strong lust, young celibate men in the jungle, strong lust might come up. Just pay attention to the moment that it ceases. It can't last all day, it doesn't last all day, and just pay attention, oh it ceased. You see these three characteristics, the various types of delusion based on the ignorance of the truth, they all just fall away. Notice the cessation. And notice the mind that doesn't have a powerful key laser affecting it and notice how pleasant that is. Another challenge that we all have is that we've all had so much sensuality, we've all had so much kind of uh, indulgence because the modern world is hedonistic. And we have to train ourselves to understand that the happiness of a celibate monk isn't necessarily peak experience. It's more like things like contentment serenity, calm, equipoise. But if the mind is still addicted to peak experience, it might not notice that. And so in just paying attention, okay, when there's a really strong key laser or really powerful hindrances in the mind and it's all a bit of a struggle, but you just keep paying attention, paying attention, paying attention, it ceases. And the mind might not be experiencing incredible rapture or amazing collectedness, but just notice the mind without a coarse kilesa and a mind without a strong hindrance, and you'll just notice this kind of background calm, which is pleasant. And if in noticing that calm, the background calm in mindful awareness, this is very important because the next time the hindrance comes up, the next time the kilesa come up, and if you can rest in that trust more and more in that which knows these things. And you develop an appetite or an appreciation for ordinary calm. And it takes a while because you have to train yourself not to be addicted to peak experience and you have to train yourself to be content. And over a period of years you actually realize this kind of contentment is really, really nice. Tanajan Samedo sometimes says, peacefulness can be quite boring if you want something else. But if you train your mind to rest in peace and appreciate peace, peace is deeply nourishing. 
and that kind of ordinary calm when you have enough mindfulness not to pick up the hindrance and go with it, not to pick up the kilesas and feed them, when you have enough contentment to stay with ordinary calm, boring peacefulness, that's an excellent foundation for your samadhi to really develop if you put forth an effort. In terms of things which are helpful in Tao Dhamma, I just wanted to say another thing I found helpful was set yourself a bit of a program. So if you have this long, spacious day and for the first few days you're very inspired but then all of a sudden you find yourself with a lot of time and you get upset with yourself for not doing enough sitting or upset with yourself for not doing enough walking and, and so be realistic and I would really recommend that you decide which chants you're going to learn get yourself a few of the chants that you want to learn while you're in Tao Dham, a few of the paritas, maybe one of the suttas and have yourself the time that you sit, the time that you walk, the time that you do your chanting. Or maybe you have a little bit of reading you want to do, the life of the Buddha, the biographies of the Kruba Ajans, but don't get completely lost in the book and read book after book. You know, really set yourself a bit of a schedule, a certain amount of sitting, a certain amount of walking, a certain amount of chanting practice, a certain amount of study. Give your mind something to do, have that structure that your mind can then relax within its container. I found that very helpful. It took me a few years to work it out, but I found it very helpful. And if you do find that you're having a sit and the mind becomes very peaceful and you don't want to get up and do your walking or you don't want to practice your chanting, that's fine. You just find, oh, the mind became peaceful, I'm having a sit and you can sit for another hour, wonderful. But just to have that basic structure as a, as a support so that you've got something wholesome to hang on to. It's like a rail in the jungle, all this time alone. Have something wholesome to hang on to. And then learn, learn from your mind within that container. And be really interested. Mind's an incredible thing. And one of the things Ajahn Chah said, human beings actually have this mansion. That's our inheritance. And we spend most of our life hanging out in a few cramped, dusty, crowded rooms the rooms of our habits, but the human mind, just in its potential, just in its nature, just in all of the supports you put into having this particular body and mind that you have, is incredible. So in going somewhere like Daudam, you get the chance to open up a few more of these rooms and step out of this cramped and dusty mind with its habits and stretch your limits and have new perspectives and develop insights and see through delusions. It's actually really wonderful. So, I'm just saying a few words. I'm very happy that you popped in to Anandagiri. We're kind of in the middle of nowhere, so we don't get large numbers of monks popping in very often. So we're happy to see you, and happy for your accumulated merit, rejoicing in your opportunity, and wishing you every success. And certainly I hope you get enlightened. Ewa. You might have a sit for 45 minutes, that sound okay?